uh, I should tell you, uh, I don't have a very loud voice, so in case you can't hear me, please let me know. I remember my friend uh, Bob Nozick once started a lecture by saying, uh, can everybody hear me in the back? And somebody yelled out, we can't hear you in the front. And, <laughs> and, and he said, well, go to the back where you can hear me. Uh, now I, I have uh, today to talk to you about the more philosophical aspects of the subject uh, that remind me my friend, uh, Father James Sadowski, who taught philosophy at Harvard, was a great friend of Murray Rothbard, used to tell his classes, uh, the word philosophy comes from the Greek word philosophia, which means philosophy. <laughs> uh, I should tell you also, if you want a very quick understanding of praxeology and the issues I'll be discussing in this lecture, sort of a painless way to acquire this, such knowledge is to read the preface. It's just a few pages that Murray Rothbard wrote to Mises' Theory and History in the reissue of that book by the Mises Institute. He covers all the essential points in a very easy to understand fashion, a much easier presentation than you'll be getting in this lecture, I should say. So in uh, Mises considered economics part of a general science of human action. In doing that, it was a very different definition of economics from that common in the 19th century, where economics was sometimes defined as the science of wealth. So what the notion of praxeology is, is that uh, economics isn't limited to just one particular kind of action. It's, say, money-making. It covers all human action. And uh, Mises says that economics is the best developed branch of praxeology. It's funny, people will always talk about possible other branches of praxeology. Sometimes people will refer to uh, a, a theory of violent action or theory of games where that's understood in a different sense from the mathematical theory of games. But nobody ever really comes up with any of the other branches. So it's really uh, economics is really pretty closely the same as praxeology. Sometimes people use the word catalactics to mean uh, economics involving exchanges, particularly money exchanges. Now, as you will have already gathered from the previous two lectures, if you didn't know this already, uh, the method of used in praxeology is quite different from that used in mainstream economics, say the economics you would get if you were taking a uh, class in economics at one of the uh, major universities. And one thing I'll be discussing in the lecture is what are some of the differences. Uh, in praxeology, uh, we begin, uh, there's some slight difference, between Mises and Murray Rothbard here, but it doesn't really amount to that much, from the concept of action or the axiom that human beings act. Now, what do we mean by action? It's any kind of behavior with a purpose, anytime we use a means to achieve, to achieve an end. Now, one thing very important to understand when we talk about action we're talking about phenomena that take place in the world. Uh, sometimes people have a picture because praxeology is a deductive science, as I'll be talking about. They think, well, if it's deductive, that means it's somehow in your mind, and then they'll have a problem. How do we know if it's in my mind? How do we know it's out there in the world? But what we're talking about in praxeology is not various ideas or concepts that we have, but the uh, 
actions what's there in the world. And this will normally involve a movement of someone's body. Say, I want uh, some water, so I pick up the, the uh, bottle of water and I drink from it. So I had a means, I wanted uh, to satisfy my thirst, so I had the, the bottle of water was the means, and then I, I, drank, for, I drank, so that's use of means to achieve an end. Now, as I say, normally this will involve, action involves movement of the body, but it doesn't have to. Now, probably you're thinking there, well, uh, you're thinking of a case where somebody is just waiting, and you read that counts as action also. But there are other cases as well. For example, suppose I were running a meeting, and I said there was a motion. Somebody proposed something like, let's lynch the lecture. And then I say, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by remaining seated. So you've all remained seated, so you've performed the action of voting in favor of lynching me. Uh, so see, this would be a case where you, uh, you can act without moving your body, but most cases of action aren't like that. So from this idea of action or the axiom that human beings act, plus a few supplementary postulates, the rest of praxeology is deduced. The supplementary postulates are there's a disutility of labor. Normally, when we labor in the sense we're exerting energy to achieve some end that we want, we get tired after a while. We don't want to continue the activity. And this is something that isn't something that we can just know by thinking about it's just added as a supplementary posture also that there's a variety of goods and services would be added to the action axiom and from this that the science of praxeology is deduced now uh, when we talk about deduction it's very important that we understand what's meant by that uh, for those of you who've taken uh, mathematical logic, of course, in that you think, well, the deduction that we do in praxeology doesn't at all resemble deduction as you've learned it in these courses, because in mathematical logic, we have everything set out for, uh, formally. We're having symbols that we can have. We have formal proofs of these. Uh, various uh, theorems by rule deduction rules, but this isn't what's taking place in praxeology. In praxeology, deduction is what's called material deduction, where we're thinking about what's involved in the concept of action. So at each step, we have to understand what, uh, what we're saying. And we have to we're, we have a, a knowledge of what action is, and then we're trying to draw out from this knowledge what's involved in in action. And this is what's meant by deduction. It's not a, a process where we can just uh, follow certain for, formal rules, and then in that kind of deduction, we're really not interested in interpreting each step of a deduction as long as we know what applying the rules properly. We just want to know at the conclusion, then we can get an interpretation of that. So the steps are just mechanical ways of getting to the conclusion, but in praxeology it's different. We have to understand every step so we know why each step is true. Uh, uh, here is an example, a few example of what's uh, meant by deduction in the sense of drawing out what is involved in our concept of action. One I've given already, every action uses means to achieve an end, and every action is uh, 
a choice between alternatives. One thing very important here, which is very different from uh, mainstream neoclassical economics, is that the alternatives that the chooser, the actor is considering, uh, the various uh, preferences that he's ranking, exist only when the actor is choosing. In neoclassical economics, uh, involves very often setting up very elaborate preference scales, and they'll have all possible combinations of choices that people will make uh, covering all sorts of alternatives. But in uh, praxeology, we're only interested in the alternatives that an actor is considering at a particular moment. And uh, another difference here that is very much related to the one I've just mentioned is that uh, in uh, neoclassical economics, there are various rules that uh, people will give, the sort of requirements for rational preferences. For example, one is that preferences have to be transitive. For example, uh, I shouldn't have this preference ordering. I prefer A to B, B to C, and C to A. That would be intransitive preference. So in neoclassical economics, that's considered an irrational set of preferences, but uh, we don't have that in Austrian economics. Uh, Mises has a discussion of that in human action somewhere around 105 or so. He says, we don't have, we don't use the, uh, have the transitivity axiom. So that's a big difference. Another example would be uh, one in neoclassical economics. They have what's called uh, uh, so the certain, uh, if you have a choice between two options and you prefer A to B, and then a third option is introduced, that shouldn't make you change your preference between A and B. Uh, example of this is this violates, there's a story about uh, a waitress who said to a customer, uh, you have a choice uh, between apple pie and peach pie. The customer said, well, I'll take apple pie. So then, uh, few minutes later, the waitress came back. She said, oh, I, I forgot to mention, uh, we also have uh, cherry pie. So he says, oh, well, in that case, I'll take the peach pie. <laughs> so that would violate this ax axiom of uh, uh, independ independence of irrelevant alternatives. So that, again, that isn't used in, in, the, in Austrian economics. It's a very minimal conception use of preferences, only the choices that are an actor is actually considering are in the ones that we're interested in. Uh, a further point is that the actor will always choose his highest value alternative. Say, if you're here listening to this lecture, that indicates you preferred doing that to doing something else. You might have regret the choice now, but that, that's another matter. But that was your preference. Uh, now, some people say, they'll give an objection that says, oh, well, you're just defining the highest valued preference as the one you, in fact, choose. So you're not really saying anything. You're just saying you choose the one you choose. But that isn't that isn't right. The the claim is you 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 have a certain ranking of your preferences, and in fact you will choose the one that's highest. The uh, it's not that you're defining the highest one as the one you choose. It's making the substantive claim. And I should say there's some people who don't accept that. They some uh, philosophers talk about strong 
strong cases of weakness of will, kind of strong weakness of will. It was kind of an odd term. But they would deny that. They would say it makes sense to say sometimes you don't choose the one you value the highest. But in Austrian economics, so we're, we're denying that a strong weakness of will is possible. You always will choose your highest valued preference. Now, one thing that was covered in Joseph Lerno's lecture, but it's very important, I'll go over it again, is a means is whatever an actor thinks will help him realize his goal. So it doesn't matter if the means won't work, say, uh, if, say, you have an enemy and you think that uh, making a small doll of that person and sticking pins in it will cause that person harm, then you're doing that as a means to the end of causing that person harm, even if that's not uh, an effective way of doing. So, of course, for all I know, it might actually be an effective way of doing harming someone. I, I've never tried it. I, you know, you're, there are always new things you can try out. <laughs> but it's regardless of, again, regardless of how the, uh, what it, you, one might think that the uh, actor is, uh, at, of the actor's choice, that's considered a rational action. He, he's using what he thinks is a means to attain his goal. Uh, we could have cases where, say, you might think there's something wrong with the something peculiar about the person's end, like supposing somebody decides to, thinks he's the Emperor Napoleon and decides to write pamphlets uh, letting people know that he's the Emperor Napoleon. That would still count as a, an action in the Austrian sense, even if they, uh, you would think, well, the person's goal is based on false information, a false belief that the person is the, the Emperor Napoleon, it's still action. So as Mises says in Epistemological uh, Problems of Economics, he says, a quotation, in dealing with uh, price economics does not act what things are in the eyes of other people, but only are what they are in the meaning of those intent on getting them. So it's a very subjective view of what preferences are it's, and what action is. It's whatever the actor regards that means to achieve his end. And uh, economics doesn't make judgments about what the end is, uh, say, if that's what somebody wants. That's just uh, accepted because if we're trying to explain someone's action, what's important is what are the goals, what is the end that the person has, and what are the means that the person regards appropriate to attain those ends. Uh, to go on a bit with this, uh, when we're trying to explain action, I say we're concerned with what the actor prefers. So economics isn't a normative discipline. It doesn't tell you what you should choose. It's saying uh, people choose certain means to achieve an end, but it doesn't say you're right or wrong to want something. Say if somebody uh, wants to devote his life to eating as, as much ice cream as he possibly can, uh, Praxeology wouldn't say that's either a good or bad choice of, of end. It would just say that's what the person has chosen. So in explaining the action, that's what we're considering. Now, it doesn't follow from that that there aren't any such things as objective judgments of value. Uh, somebody could hold there are objective judgments of value, but it's just that there aren't, uh, they aren't involved in economics. Uh, Mises took the view that there weren't objective judgments of value, 
all that there are are subjective preferences, that that's all there is to it. But that view of his, and he certainly has arguments for that, for that view, that is a philosophical view that isn't part of praxeology or economics. Somebody could hold, it's just that in economics, we don't make such judgments. Uh, now, when I said that economics doesn't make uh, judgments, uh, evaluate uh, uh, values that people hold, there, it wasn't entirely true. It's one of quite a number of false statements you'll find in this lecture. Uh, uh, that was supposed to be a joke, but <laughs> yes, you know, I always feel, I feel sometimes it's, it's you know, I always a bit disappointed people don't laugh at my jokes, but much worse than that is if people laugh at what I intend as serious comments. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's happened on, on occasion. So the way that what I said wasn't entirely true is that economics doesn't evaluate ultimate ends. If someone says, well, here's what I want. I don't have any reason for this. This is it. This is what I want. I just want to eat as much ice cream as possible. Economics, praxeology couldn't say you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't uh, have such an end. But what praxeology could say is if you think that something is a means to achieve a certain end, we can evaluate that. We could say, say if you thought eating as much ice cream as possible is a way to uh, maximize your, your resistance to disease, we could evaluate, that would be a statement we could evaluate. Uh, now, when in praxeology, what we're interested in is not particular actions that people do, not things like you're coming to this lecture or you're eating ice cream, but what's involved in any action, what could be called the form of the action as opposed to the matter of the action, kind of what is it about behavior that's required to make an action. And so we're considering the, f the form, what's involved in any action. And praxeology, in trying to answer that question, what's the form of an action, doesn't make quantitative claims about action. It, it, for example, suppose we say uh, lowering the price of a good will, other things being equal, result in increase in quantity demanded of the good. Praxeology couldn't tell you how much of an increase there will be. It'll just say there'll be an increase. And Mises takes the view in human action, there aren't any constants. There aren't any, any uh, things that can be measured. So we could come up with numerical laws about action. We could just have general uh, claims about what is the form of an action. Now, a key principle of praxeology is that only individuals act. Say, uh, we could talk about each of you coming to this lecture, but we couldn't talk in the same way of the group of you, the people who are in the audience listening to the lecture, unless that was analyzed in terms of each person here uh, listening to the lecture. So there wouldn't be, if we say, the group, you're all listening to the lecture, the group is listening, that would just be analyzed as each individual is listening. So it's only the individuals are acting. Now sometimes methodological individualism is misunderstood that as the as the more radical claim that nations and classes don't exist, but that isn't right. It, say if we say, for example, uh, the U.S. declared war on Japan on December eighth, nineteen forty-one. That's to be analyzed. That in terms of certain people, the uh, President Roosevelt. 
gave a speech to Congress and various people in Congress voted a resolution of war. And after that, various other people did various things. So that would be what meant by the U.S. declared war on Japan. It we certainly wouldn't be a good way of thinking. There's no such thing as the United States or no such thing as Japan. Now, you might think this principle that only individuals act seems obvious, but there are people who've denied it. And uh, at the time Mises was writing Human Action, uh, those people were more prominent than they are now. For example, uh, there was a professor at University of Vienna who was a very big enemy of Mises named Otmar Spahn. And he said, it's the group that's primary, not the individual. So it's the group that's acting. And what Mises was very concerned to, uh, uh, ar to argue against that. Uh, now, as the start of the lecture, I mentioned that uh, praseology is used a different method from the ones that's used in the phys in mainstream economics. And the way that it's different is in mainstream economics, they follow a method that's like that used in the physical sciences. So what's done is that the economists will uh, come up with a formal model that will have certain axioms, where axioms is used very differently from praxeology, where praxeology, a, uh, an axiom, the axiom of action is something that's claimed to be true, but in axiom is used in mathematics, it's just a starting point. You're not claiming that the axiom is true, it's just you're drawing, you have certain axiom, you have a formal deductions from that, and then you have testing to see whether what you did do, your model is correct. So you see the, the extreme difference between the Austrian uh, method and the uh, mainstream. And the mainstream is, the Austrian method is you're at every step, you know what you're uh, claiming is true. In the mainstream method, you're deducing the propositions formally, and then you test them empirically. Uh, so the mainstream uh, supporters say, well, the reason we should proceed in this way where you come up with uh, a certain formal model and testing is that that's the way science has progressed since the scientific revolution that the view is, well, up until the uh, 16th century, really, people were just trying to speculate about the, the natural world just by following Aristotle or just trying to uh, deduce what the nature of motion was just by thinking about it. But that wasn't very successful until we started getting Galileo and others who were actually performing experiments knowledge has really progressed this tremendously. I don't think that's really such an accurate picture of science, but regardless of that, even if it were, the Austrian view would be in economics, it isn't like the physical sciences. Is In the physical sciences, they were looking at uh, objects externally, say if we, we're see, look at two physical particles in motion, all we can do is look at them and see, do experiments, see what happens. But in human action, we know action from the inside since we ourselves are acting. So we have, can you have a different way of understanding based on, on our own knowledge of action. We know what it is to act in a way that we don't know what would be the case with the physical particles. And say, if you uh, have an experiment where you uh, roll a, a, a ball down an inclined plane, you really won't know what's going to happen till you see what it does. You could have a 
deduction of what you think will happen. You'll have to test it out. But it, human action isn't like that. Uh, now, supposing there is a problem that uh, the supporters of the, this mainstream view will have if they claim that their method, that's to say the one that you start off with a certain model and then test it out, they say that's the only way you can attain knowledge. Uh, they'll get into a problem is that that claim itself, that's to say, this is the only way you can get knowledge, is a philosophical claim. It doesn't, it isn't itself the product of modeling and testing. So how do they know, it would seem, how do they know this claim is true? If it is, what they say is, to get knowledge, you have to model things and test them. But that wasn't modeled and tested. So how are they supposed to know that? I think that, uh, Sometimes you'll, uh, people will make, who in the sciences very often, people will make claims about certain philosophical points that they think are scientific, but they're actually not. Uh, so supposing we don't think that the uh, mainstream supporters of uh, the scientific, so-called scientific method have made out a good case, now we come to the key question of how do we know that the principles of praxeology are true? It isn't, say, just because the Mises says so or Rothbard says so. How do we know that what you're learning this week really is true? And this question has led to a lot of confusion, but I want to suggest there's a very easy answer. I think sometimes in in philosophy, there's a tendency to want to come up with complicated answers when we don't need them. Uh, well, I'll get, give some examples of that a bit later. But the matter is quite simple, is that the action axiom is something that's obviously true. We, as soon as we understand it, we grasp that it, it's true. We don't need to uh, get support from it from other things. Uh, there are it isn't the only such obviously true statement. For example, others might be, uh, I have a body, uh, the earth has been, other people exist, or the earth has been around a, a lot longer than I am, or the earth is larger than I am. These are obviously true statements. They're not ones that we have to subject to further testing to find out whether they're true. Sometimes in philosophy, these obviously true statements are called Moorean facts after the great British philosopher G. E. Moore, who emphasized facts of this kind a great deal in his, uh, in his uh, philosophical work, work in a very famous paper uh, called, um, uh, trying to, he said, how can we prove there's an external world? He said, well, I'm holding up one hand here. I'm holding up another hand. So there are two hands. Therefore, there's an external world. So what he's doing there, he's appealing to certain obvious facts as something that is not subject to further challenge or required testing. So it's similar in uh, praxeology, the uh, the axiom that human beings act is just something that's obviously true. So uh, the, this, these obvious truths can, are known to be true just by thinking of them, and they can't be overthrown by uh, further observation. It isn't that, say, something's going to come up to sh in the future to show that human beings never did act. This was all a, a false claim. All the facts are in. It isn't up for further testing. So this is one way of defining a priori truth. It's one that is not subject to further testing. It's known to be true. That's all there is to it. There are 
some uh, philosophers, such as very famous uh, American philosopher uh, W. V. O. Quine, who claimed in a paper in 1951, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, that there aren't any a priori truths. He thought everything is subject to further testing. But I don't think he's really come up with good reasons for thinking that. He said uh, everything is, the world is, uh, faces experience as a whole, and he thought we can't single out particular propositions that are never are just known to be true, and that's it. But uh, that claim doesn't seem to me to be a correct one. Uh, now, one uh, perhaps controversial point I'll mention, there are some people how, who ask, well, how do we discover these obvious truths, ones that are supposed to be uh, immune to overthrow by uh, future observation. So some people will appeal to a certain fact about certain statements that, uh, for example, suppose I say I don't exist. Probably many of you wishing that was a true statement by now. But <laughs> suppose I say I don't exist. So the f I couldn't say I don't exist unless I did exist. Uh, because uh, if I don't exist, I can't make the statement I don't exist. So this kind of case is called a performative contradiction in which my making a certain statement shows that the statement is false. If I say, for example, uh, I've never, I say in English, I never in my life uh, spoken a sentence in English. My saying that shows that the statement is false, since that is an English sentence. So some people have suggested, well, that's a test for a priori truth, but it, it isn't true of all a priori truth. For example, suppose I say 2 plus 2 equals 5, which is false, necessarily false statement. So my saying that it isn't that I could only say 2 plus 2 equals 5 if 2 plus 2 equals 4. So that would be a case of a, a, a priori. Not, uh, I couldn't show that 2 plus 2 equals 4 by showing that a statement denying it is a performative contradiction. Uh, now, uh, one point that could be raised is in the claim that by obvious truths that I made vulnerable to objection, uh, suppose I'm a, a brain in a vat and I'm being manipulated by scientists to think I have a, a, a body, wouldn't I have the same experiences as I have right now? So how can I say that my claim, I have a body or I'm acting, is immune to further observation? Uh, well, Anthony has, I think, raised a key point is that praxeology is not an attempt, although it, it, to answer the philosophical question of skepticism about the external world. Remember, praxeology or economics is one of the sciences. It may not be, use the same method as the physical sciences, but it's one of the sciences. And in the sciences, we don't, uh, we take for granted that the world exists, say, uh, for example, if an astronomer is looking at certain uh, stars, uh, he wouldn't say, well, how do I know that there's actually anything that I'm looking at? I mean, there might be cases where he thinks there are defects in his telescope, but the notion that, the whole, that uh, all the data could be the result of illusion is not one that comes up in the sciences. In the sciences, we take the existence of the world for granted. Uh, it uh, it would be rather odd if, say, uh, imagine, say, economists were talking about what are the causes of the uh, of the two thousand and eight recession. If somebody said, "Oh, well, look, you know, you're talking about asking what are the causes of reception of recession," 
but we have to establish there's an external world first. We, we haven't done that. That really wouldn't make sense. So uh, a related point to this is praxeology is not an attempt to solve a philosophical problem of other minds. This problem is, suppose I know, well, I know I'm thinking myself, but how do I know anyone else is thinking? Maybe you're all robots who've been pre-programmed to uh, emit certain uh, sounds. How do I know there actually are any other minds? That isn't a, a isn't a question that praxeology is, ans is concerned with. Praxeology is not about my mind or my actions, but with actions, which are actions out there in the world. There isn't a problem of how do I take of a cognitive leap where I say, how do I go from my own thoughts to what's true of other people? It starts with actions, the actions of out there in the world. Now, uh, the point that I made, uh, one of the points I made about that the praxeology is a priori true, that their state, these statements are immune from further testing, is in conflict with Karl Popper's famous falsifiability criterion for scientific statements, because what Popper said was, in order to count as a scientific statement, we have to, uh, uh, it has to be capable of being shown false by future observation. We have to be able to specify some observation that would show the statement to be false. For example, suppose I say all swans are white, that could be falsified if by coming up with a black swan, a swan that wasn't white. So what uh, problem here is if is that Popper has just arbitrarily ruled out a priori truths, ones that can't be shown to be false as scientific, because he just said, look, there has to be some possible observation that would show the statement is false, otherwise it's not scientific. So therefore, a priori statements can't be scientific, but that's just an arbitrary uh, the definition of scientific and Mises' response to that in his, one of his, I think his last book, Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, was to say, well, Popper should have just looked at what's actually done in economics so rather than come up with a, some sort of preconceived notion of what science is. And I think uh, one reason I mentioned Popper in this I'll end on, is that one of the greatest obstacles, or perhaps the greatest obstacle, to consideration of praxeology by economists is the influence of Popper and his followers, especially called, especially ones that call themselves critical rationalists, because they hold that everything is tentative. All that we have are conjectures. And They'll have a view such as there's no good reason to believe anything. Well, I suppose there's no good reason to believe that, then so I don't believe it. So uh, I should say that the Popperian views, although they're popular among economists, aren't really that popular anymore among mainstream philosophers of science. But the basic difference here is just in the reluctance to accept that we actually know things. And as I've hoped to show in this lecture, that it, reluctance is not to be found in praxeology. We do know things in praxeology. All right, thank you. <laughs>